welcome to Camel Shake Podcast, episode 68. And of course, as always, we have a special guest on the show. But before we get there, remember, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, um, you know, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash Camel Shake, where you can see our faces in full Technicolor, if our sultry voices aren't enough for you. In any event, that being said, let's get straight into it. In today's episode, we have a very special guest. It is wildlife photojournalist, conservation photographer, resident photographer on the History Channel's photo face-off, no other than Justin Mott. Justin, how's it going, man? Very good. Well, not great, I should say. We just went back into lockdown here in Hanoi, but oh, overall, I, I shouldn't complain. We've had a good year in Vietnam for COVID, so I shouldn't be too too sad, but it is a little depressing. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Man. How, how long are you expecting to be in lockdown for? We don't know. Two weeks in severe lockdown. We can't leave the house, can't go anywhere without permission. Okay. Feels like I'm grounded from my mother. <laughs> oh man, is, it, is, it, is this the is this the first full lockdown over there, or have you done this before? So in Hanoi last year, while well, early on in last not this past 2020 in February, we we were in lockdown for a couple of weeks. Uh, things went really well. After that, Vietnam's you know it's a communist country, so very strict when things happen. They're very good at mm. just sort of organizing, and everyone sort of follows you know one message one system for everything, kind of the opposite of where I'm from in the U.S. So things have been really good for a year, but here we go with the Delta variant and not really sure what's happening, but we're, we're just newly in lockdown. That Delta thing is getting everywhere. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's just, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, here, you know, over here in the U.K., although we're opening up, you know, everything like society is opening up again, but it seems like that, that Delta variant is going crazy everywhere. So I'm not yeah. really entirely sure why we're opening up. There must be a reason for it. I don't understand it. I'm sure yeah. there's some science behind it somewhere. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> so, yeah, you, you'd hope so, right? <laughs> cool. Uh, Justin, you're based in in Hanoi, in Vietnam. How did you mm -hmm. How did you end up in Vietnam? Wrong turn. No, I, I came here as a. <laughs> I, I I was still finishing up school. I had about a year left of school. I was going to school for journalism at San Francisco State University, and I just needed a break. Uh, my father had passed away. Uh, I just kind of looking for a different perspective on things. I, I went and worked the summer back where I'm from, back where my dad grew up on this tiny little island called Block Island off the coast of Rhode Island in, in the northeast of the U.S. Hmm. And I saved up some money and I decided to kind of come out here and go on a, not really a backpacking trip because I was in like my mid to late 20s. I just came out here with my camera and was traveling around for a bit and I kind of fell in love with Vietnam. I had actually worked with a bartender at, in San Francisco, I was paying my way through school. I worked with a bartender who was a vet of the war, and he would always bring these clippings about Vietnam. I was talking about Vietnam, and he was fascinated with it. And I thought, that seems like an interesting place I should check out. We used to ride the bus together. Uh, you know, I was, I was, yeah, when I first started working, I was in my early 20s, and he was in his late, maybe late 50s, early 60s. And he was, it was interesting, his perspective after fighting in the war here and loving the country so much afterwards and his attachment to it. And I just kind of, I saved up some money. I came out here for a few months to, to wander around my camera and tell some stories. And I never really looked back after that. I started, I would go home for a few months and find myself drawn back here. And then I married my wife who's Vietnamese and, and I've never thought about leaving ever since. <laughs> so do you speak Vietnamese? No, not very well. I speak enough to get by enough in a taxi where they think I speak Vietnamese really well. And then they try to elevate the conversation. And I go, well, I will blame it. I will blame it on my wife being a translator when we first started. She mm. she did all the yeah. translation for like the Oscars here. And I also blame it on early on in my career up until actually even up until COVID happened, I would spend probably 80, 80 to 90 percent of my time outside of Vietnam for different jobs for my commercial photography and my editorial and assignment photography. So I, I wasn't really here much. And I'm just bad at learning languages. So those are the couple of factors why I don't speak the language well. And I've, I've just recently really gotten interested in Vietnam, and that's um, largely due to, you know, looking at, at images on your website. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a stunning, stunning country. Um, it's, it's weird how sometimes you can get an impression, you know, when, when sort of you, you know, when uh, most of the input that you get is like from, I don't know, Vietnam war movies or whatever, and all you see is jungle. And then, you know, all of a sudden you realize that that's really not all it is. It's just, you know, it's just a stunning variety of landscapes. Yeah, it's so it's so different. It's a lot different than the way it's been portrayed in movies. I think mm -hmm. it's such an easy way to portray it in movies and talk about war and post-war. But we are very we are many many decades removed from the war. It's a different country. It's evolved very quickly. The economy's booming. Things have changed quite a bit here. 
uh, it's a very modern society in a lot of ways. And the country is very different from north to south. And there's a lot of beauty here. And even to this day, as a photographer, I'm still inspired to shoot here. Is the war still a factor over there in the, you know, it's still thought about in, because it wasn't that long ago in, in, in the great scheme of things. Um, it, I often fascinates, fascinates me of countries like that, how quickly they can or can't put those things behind them. Yeah, I, w- I would say for, for, it's hard to speak for, I can't speak for all Vietnamese, but the Vietnamese that I've been in contact with that barely ever talk about the war, the young Vietnamese don't really bring up the war. Uh, a lot of people actually get insulted when when you have movies about Vietnam that like are too much about the war or even they're yeah. set in present day, but talking about the war. I mean, I think, you know, even Spike Lee's movie about Vietnam, I think a lot of people were were turned off by that. A lot of pe- foreigners that live here and Vietnamese people that live here because it's not really an accurate portrayal of what modern day Vietnam is really like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I find I find this. I mean, the same thing is really true for you know um, the way that Germany sometimes projects that. That's originally I grew up in Germany, and you know mm. you, the only time you ever see you know German input in like Hollywood movies is when when they're Nazis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah, go, yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> you know? Right. Luckily, in, in, it's changed quite a bit. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so just you know, it's kind of it's hilarious on on, on one hand. Um, I tell you what, what um, amuses me the most is is when you have like you know actors portraying Nazis, like in like Indiana Jones is a really good example, and then <laughs> and then they start speaking German in the movie, and you know exactly what they're not German actors, like right, they right. can't even. That's not even German. <laughs> it's like they're making it up. It's like it's yeah. like just something that sounds like or supposed. It's to be like something. Vietnamese. Yeah, Vietnamese sometimes in movies are portrayed by like Thai people, and or it'll be set in Thailand. Like even a lot of that movie. Uh, what was it? Kong was was like filmed in Thailand. Some of it was filmed in Vietnam, but stuff was filmed in Thailand as well. Yeah. Wildlife photojournalism. So when I first saw that, I kind of, I thought like, what is that? Um, so what's the, like for, for those of our viewers who are not necessarily too familiar with your work, how would you describe like the difference between wildlife photography and wildlife photojournalism? Yeah, I, I think there can be some crossover, but in the traditional sense, wildlife photography is is often about those like pictures, just wildlife photography in general, those like long lens pictures, right? Those 70 to 200 or, you know, those giant, giant lenses just showing the beauty of the animals, showing the beauty of the landscape and things like that, where, and there can be stories to, those photographers can tell stories with their images, but I would say wildlife photojournalism is more about telling stories about animals and people and, and the relationship between them. In, with stories, not just individual images, or even even through individual images as well, but it's it's more story based, and for me, it's more long form documentary. And it's not something I've always done with my career. It's something I pivoted to a couple of years ago. Uh, I do a lot of commercial work, but I started working with the New York Times, started doing a lot of assignment work here in Southeast Asia. But as I started to do more commercial work, I realized. I wanted to do something that really meaningful to me. So I, I really love animals. I love people that take care of animals. I like that relationship between people and animals. And it's just one of those things. I started in personal projects. I started in documentary photography and it took 10 years to get back to doing something I'm really passionate about. It took it took me being in a financial situation that I was stable, that I could say, okay, forget everything else. Forget like, mm-hmm. oh, is this story marketable? Can I pitch this to my editor at the New York Times or the Washington Post? Or, no, I just decided I'm going to just look at stories that I want to tell and tell them with the amount of time that I can afford to tell them. And it was just like a nice relief. It took a long time to get to that point in my life, but that's what happened. I was like, I, I just miss photographing what I love to do. That's why I started in photography. It took a long journey to get back to that point, but that's where I'm at. And I absolutely love that. So yeah, it's it's tough. I guess wildlife photojournalism is just more like any photojournalism, but just directed at wildlife stories and conservation stories, such as my, my lead story I did with my uh, personal project Kenji Guardians about the last two northern white rhinos. Yeah, this I saw that, and that was really I found it really touching. That was you know I, yeah. was, I oh. absolutely was not aware that there are only oh. two left. Well, thank you, and I, and I think like for me in the beginning of my career, I also have to say like it's important for me to to get sort of this out there. Like at the beginning of my career, it was always like when when you work in that competitive atmosphere of like those big newspapers and big magazines. For me, I, I was never a a uh, full-time photographer for the New York Times, but I did a ton of work for them. But you're always like, you're always competing and you're always like, oh, I can't do this story because someone else did the story. Or this, uh, they, you know, the Wall Street Journal beat us to it or National Geographic beat us to it. And now it's like later on in my career, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in that competitive world. I'm glad I don't have to like adhere to those rules of those like 
people in that industry. I mean, I like it in some ways, but I, I like kind of one foot in, one foot out. And like for the Northern White Rhino story, for example, like National Geographic had already done the story about the last male when he passed away. And that would mm. that would like deter a lot of photographers from doing that. And they would be like, well, they got the story first. And now I thought, I don't care anymore. I can reach an audience in a different way. I don't need to like, it did get published in the Washington Post, which is good, but I didn't know that going into it. And I can reach an audience just on my own now through social media and my own outlet. So I just said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it in the scope of putting it out there to a different audience. I hope Vietnamese people can see this. I hope people in China can see this and I can reach people in a different way because, you know, for stories like that, the consumption side is happening in Vietnam. It is happening in China. It is happening throughout Southeast Asia. So I just, I just look at things like with, you know, when you're in it, when you're in the mix of it, you're so, you have to like adhere to their rules. And now I don't, and it's kind of, it's kind of liberating. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really interesting thing because I mean, especially when it comes to personal projects, you know, um, I feel sometimes you just have to leave everything aside. And if it's something that you're really passionate about, then you just have to go in and do it, you know, for better or for worse, you know? Yeah. And, and it's finding the project that you can grow into. For me, I'm 43 years old. I spent a, all, all of my thirties doing other people's stories, other people's projects. And it was great. And I'm lucky to have done that and had the opportunity to do that. But there reached a time in your life where you start to think about like, what's my legacy going to be? What am I going to, what do I want to say that I did with my photography and my career? And, this is something I wanted to do. And this was a project that I could also grow into. You know, it's like, I, it's not just one story, it's any story around the world. So I'm trying to find different stories in different countries and different animals. So it's, it's pretty free. I, you know, anything I find interesting, I can go like just before the pandemic, 48 hours before everything shut down in Vietnam, I was supposed to be on a plane to Austria to photograph a guy that w lives and works in a castle doing conservation on turtles. I mean, he sounds like a Wes Anderson character. It was just like, <laughs> I never got to do that story, but I will one day. <laughs> yeah. Like these stories I find that I, again, I don't care. I don't care if they have an outlet. I don't care if they're marketable or, you know, sellable. That doesn't matter to me if they fit within my context of just finding that interesting people that have a bond with animals. Those are my only parameters. Uh, do you find that you've got, you found yourself almost a new level of enjoyment with your photography since being able to do more personal projects than projects that perhaps were, you know, in the competitive world that you were describing? Well, 100%. I mean, when, when I got back into this, I could actually slow down again. I was always like, everything was so fast for me. Like, again, when I started my career, it was, oh, I can go do a project in Vietnam. I like the story. I'm going to spend three weeks on it, or I'm going to spend one day a week on it for several months. And when you start doing assignment photography, it doesn't happen that way. And as you know, as journalism budget shrunk, it was even less. So it was like, oh, can you do this travel story that might take four days? Can you do it in a day and fly back? Because they pay you per day. So it's been very liberating to slow down, but I, I, I've only been able to slow down because I've allowed myself to slow down. But I also switched my entire kit over too. Like I went to a very more, a lot more minimalistic kit. I went back to shooting Leica and I went back to shooting with mainly just one prime lens and one camera and traveling light not worrying about all these different things and just like, oh, this is the story. This is, you know, like I can slow down and look for the little nuances. Like for example, I remember I was in Suriname doing a story about a woman who, who rehabilitates slots, right? And it was like, if I just went there for a day, I need that shot of her like interacting with the slot and that's it. I mean, it's not it, but like, that's all I could really get at like that shot and a couple other shots. But with more time and giving myself more time, you start to see other little things. Like, and those are the things that I enjoy about photography, those little things you notice after like three or four days shadowing someone. Like I noticed she was always looking up into the trees. So I'm like, what is she doing? Even when she's driving, she's looking up like this lady. And then I was like, oh, that's a nice narrative to build into my story, into yeah. like a 15 picture photo story. Like trying to find these little moments where with her driving or sitting and looking up because that's her, that's so her. Like I would have never seen that in day one. So many other photographers, maybe they would have, but. I'm not good enough. Like I wouldn't have seen that the first day and having more time to watch that. I'm like, Oh, that's nice. That's a little thing. Or even like the rhinos, the caretakers, like I might not have been able to like build that trust with them to go back into their, their little area where they live, their little campsite where they live and photograph them. That takes time. It takes, you know, they need to trust me and, and you just need to build them. I haven't had that with assignment work. So with personal work, I get that. And it's really gratifying. Do you no, feel that in, with combination of, of all of what you just described that you're coming out with better images now, doing these projects than perhaps before yeah a hundred percent because i because i have time you know i'm not yeah. on that like I'm, I'm not in those parameters of like oh i need to get 15 pictures for a slideshow i need to get it for the day and i need to file it the next day 
you know, and then I need to get yeah. on to the next assignment and, and fill out all my expenses and figure out where I'm going next. And now it's like, oh, the story, I could think the story is this and it's not, so I can go in a different direction, which is nice. Like when I photographed, uh, I was doing a story on the soy dogs, street dogs in Phuket, and they wanted me to document this elderly, elderly gentleman who would like clean up after the dogs. And I thought, okay, it sounds interesting. But when I got there, he's great. And the work he does is great, but he basically picks up poop all day. So I, I'm, what am I going to do? Get a 15 picture photo essay of him picking up poop. And then he goes home <laughs> and then, I, I, but you know, having time to sit around, sit and watch and follow him and make those mistakes and realize, okay, I, he does great work, but it's not visually interesting to me and doesn't fit in my project as well. But I got to see the a small, another room that has like a physical therapy center where they do training with dogs and they rehabilitate them and learn how to walk and have hydrotherapy and these fantastic machines. And it wasn't visually that interesting, but it was more interesting the other story. And even though it was all in the small confines of one room, I could say, okay, I'm going to take like three days to wait for the right moments to happen within that. And that patience and that time is, is how you get a good story. Yeah. It's one of the most, uh, one of my favorite um, images in the sloth story, by the way, is that one shot where like the sloth hand or claw is like, you know, hooking up with, I think the lady's hand and it's like, they're holding yeah. hands. That's such a great shot. You know, it's so oh, like that. emotional, like it's a, it's a great shot. I appreciate that. She's such a, a, a fantastic woman. That story was tricky because, you know, when I talked to Monique, she, she called her sort of the sloth lady of Suriname. That's what she, people call her there. So she wouldn't be offended. Other people call her that. <laughs> but, <laughs> But she, she, the other thing that's great about her is like, I, and funny thing I find is people are kind of like the animals that they protect. Like she was very sloth like. Everything she did was slow. <laughs> you know, from a technical standpoint, it was kind of nice because I shoot with a manual focused camera. So like shooting sloths is like the ultimate for my project. Shooting gibbons was horrible. Shooting sloth, and I love the gibbon story, but it was so difficult. Shooting sloths was like, Ah, oh, okay. That slap will go from there to there. I've got like an hour to capture that shot. So I, get time to get. I, I see why you like she, shooting turtles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so you can probably see a lot of my project with slow animals. But you know, the the thing, the thing about that shot, the thing about her bond was it was again it's the same with like having time and allowing myself time. When I contacted her, she's like, "Listen." I said, "I could probably afford to come for like a week. It's a long way." And she's like, "Yeah, well, I do one rescue a week." And I'm like, well, I have to get that. And she's like, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's none, but I average one a week. So I gave myself more, almost like about 10 or 11 days. And I tried to plan it into like the, the time where they happen to, I was like, is there a busy month? She's like, well, sometimes this time of year is a little busier. So I plan that way. And then she she's so attached. She's so dedicated. She's like the ultimate, she's the epitome of my project, the, the definition of my project of like these people that dedicate their lives to, to helping animals. It, that, that's what she's all about. And she comes from no formal training at all. She just loves animals. That became her thing. That's the situation that's happening in Suriname is, is, you know, it's a very heavily forested country. I think it's the most densely forested country in the world per square mile. But she, so, but, but as, as it, as there's development, there's problems. The sloths have nowhere to go. They're ending up in the city. They're ending up in people's homes. And there's no formal company. Or there's no government agency to handle the stuff. So she just does it. I mean, she goes there. She takes the net. She takes the sloths down. It was so much like the funny thing about that project was the one day that it happened, an actual rescue. She had other sloths at her center, but the one rescue that happened a couple of days in, she couldn't do it by herself. So she's asking me to help her. So I'm like trying to be a human and help her, but at the same time, like. This is my chance. This is like my one shot to get a new rescue. So I'm like holding my camera at the same time, like trying to help her with the net to get the slop down. There's other people just watching, taking photos of me. I'm like, this is all wrong. You're supposed <laughs> to be helping her. I'm supposed to be documenting this. <laughs> so it's like, it's a weird little balance there. But she, she was amazing. And there wasn't a lot of opportunity, a lot of things happening because everything happened slow. But when there was... When she was with the sloths, there was plenty of opportunity for moments because she is so good with them and she is so attached to the animals. So when those moments happened, they were really nice. They were really great and they're really special. How do you find your subjects for that project? Like, how much research um, do you do? A, a lot of research. Uh, I, I'm i looking online and looking at different stories and, and it's it's sort of snowballed. In the beginning, it was just like, okay, look at different stories around the world, just, just go on online doing searches. But now since my Instagram account has been really focused on these kind of stories and I'm meeting these kind of people that 
it's like it all snowballs. So then the people like the slop ladies telling you about the dolphin guy, the dolphin guy's telling you about the turtle lady. It's like they all know each other and it's all about trust, which I totally respect because a lot of yeah. the work that they do and getting close to the animals, you need a photographer that understands the nuances. For example, the gibbon story, you know, the lady gets really close to the gibbon, she holds the gibbons, but the reason the gibbons are in the situation is because people have them as pets. So it's mm. very, you have to be very careful in how you display the image and people need to trust you. And I un totally understand that. So it gets very complicated because it's like, I need the shots of her feeding the Gibbons milk because she does that, but she doesn't want those images to look like, oh, it's cute to have a Gibbon as a pet because that's why she has to take care of them. So there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of trust, but once you earn that trust with people, once they understand like, you're not gonna just put the images out there without proper captions, you're not gonna explain things, you're not gonna answer questions. Like once you do that, you answer the questions on Instagram or, or if someone uses it out of context, you go after them or, I mean, not, you know, you correct it and that trust. And then it's just like, it's it's just people snowballing and people referring you and the stories just kind of, I mean, in the beginning it was hard, but, and now it's a little bit easier. And it's also, my parameters are different because as a wildlife photographer, you might just need to go out there and get pictures of animals, right? And remote places, or even if they have them, you've got a long lens or you go camp out. Mine's different. I need shots of people getting close to animals, but I also need them to be getting close to animals in an ethical way. So I vet my stories through some people that I know that are veterinarians or people that I know that are in wildlife conservation. I'll say like, hey, are these people any good? Or do you trust this? Does this seem like an accurate thing? You know, and then the people themselves, I say, can I, do you get close to the, the animals? Is it safe for them? Is it safe for me to get close? And, you know, is it accurate to capture that? There's a lot that plays out, a lot of dialogue that has to happen ahead of time. Mm. And I'm just very clear and concise about like, listen, I'm going to need a week. It's going to be annoying. I'm going to be like over your shoulder. It's, it is weird for people when you think about it. Like just think about someone following you around the camera for a day and then think yeah. about it for seven days. Like, you know, that and some of these people are in like remote places. And I'm just like, they wake up in the morning, have the coffee. And it's like, there I am. Like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> go. <laughs> So it, it it takes it takes a lot, you know. It's like it's 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 all trust, <laughs> and and that just like it's nice to have some of the uh, some of the editorial clients that I have behind me in my past. But it was tricky when I transitioned to this because I wasn't going there on assignment for anyone. You know, there is an inherently built-in trust or or mistrust depending on what people's politics are. But like when I say I'm doing a story for the New York Times. Some people just inherently trust me. Some people just <laughs> inherently won't trust me. But yeah. you could kind of tell the ones that would. Now it's like, oh, I'm just doing it for me because I like this project and and trust me. And and I have to take a leap of faith. <laughs> and a lot of them have. So I've been fortunate enough for that. But I guess now the advantage is, of course, that you've got a body of work there as well. So you know, if if people are maybe undecided or or, or you know, your call comes out of the blue, they ha actually have something very concrete that I can go and check it yeah check it out. it's very helpful and and i donate the images to people so like whatever organization i do this for some have great images they don't need mine but some don't and they, or they don't have a cohesive story so that's sort of like the minimalist the, the minimal i'll get out of this and they'll get out of it they'll have a nice story about themselves and and that's that's a nice thing and then we i i do my best it's not just the shoot that is their time it's afterwards it's putting the images out there capturing them you know, putting them on, on Instagram, rotating the stories in and out, answering questions that people have, linking people, tagging them. It's a lot of work, but it's it's fun. Like, I enjoy that part. Like, now it's nice. Before, my images used to just be like, here's given to my client. Here's the New York Times images. Here's whoever the client is. Your turn. You take it. And then it just goes. Now I'm actively involved in it. So I, I really enjoy that. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Do you, you, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, typically kind of 15 photos for, a, for, a, to, to tell the story you're trying to tell. Is that, is that typical for you? Is it, do you often do more, less? What, what's kind of your, your, your boundaries there with, with, with that? That's a good question, Nick. It's kind of like, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of things always go back to like your, for adults, it goes back to your childhood and for photography students, it goes back to your professor. You know, it's like, Oh, what do your professors <laughs> say? So my teacher at the time used to like, give us like 15 to like 25. And then I noticed like a lot of the major publications would do that. So my, mine is, my project is broken up a little bit differently. So every time I do a story, it's its own story, right? So that story could be published in a magazine, newspaper, but it will go on my website and I'll do a series of the posts on Instagram as a story, sequence as a story. And then a few of those images go into my hero project, which will go into a book or an exhibition or, or both hopefully in the end. So um, I'm, I'm thinking things two ways. So 
15 images is usually like the minimum. I sometimes go up to 25 images. I work with a photo editor that I used to work with at the New York Times and he helps me edit. And, and I just, because I like a second set of eyes on my work because I always yeah. feel like, I feel like I'm a decent editor of my own work, but I do like someone else to like, give me another set of eyes, give me a fresh look, someone that wasn't necessarily there on the shoot because you can get attached to images, attached to a moment. And then later on, you're like, that really wasn't that good. So I need someone to do that. I like someone to do that for me. So it depends on the story. You know, some of them tend to be a little bit longer. The Rhino story was longer because it was multifaceted. It wasn't just the Rangers. It was also the, the I mean, it wasn't just the caretakers. It was the Rangers as well. So that one was like probably around 25 images or more. And, and some of the stories are a little bit shorter. It really just depends. But they all feed into, they work on their own and they all feed into the Hero Project yeah. as well. It makes so much sense to limit it to say 15 on a on a on a on a given story because it it forces you to to really pick out the points that you you want to tell well rather than diluting yeah. it too much with all you know lots of other points which are are great as well but don't necessarily add as yeah. much as the rest of them right it's a more impactful story i guess yeah, and you, you, you have to eliminate the redundancy. And it's just so easy to yeah. have that because like certain things are just like, oh, that moment when he sat with the rhinos, I've got like eight shots of that that I love better <laughs> than the other shots where they're sitting there and having lunch. But it's like, yeah, but do I need eight shots of that? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it's hard. That's why another set of eyes helps. That's why, you know, I, I'm i also like weird. Like I really care about, I'm kind of old school that way. Like I really care about the way I sequence the story. Like I put a lot of time and effort into that and it changes as I go on and like, no, I know like a lot of people don't even look at it that way or it's not even like they might look at it on my website that way, but when it's on Instagram, it doesn't always look out that way. So, but I like care in the end, like I send photos to my editors and I'm like, here's the story sequence the way I like it. They can change it because I don't know, I'm not that cool and powerful enough to tell them to, to not change it, but I don't like it when they do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man. It can, it is, you know, it can't, it can tell a different narrative, can't it? If you shift hmm. those around. It, it really Completely, can. you know, so, some people want to reveal something right away. Sometimes even within, like, sometimes I change. Like, oh, I didn't want to say that right away. I want that to be at the end. And, and the way you close the story out, like, what are your last couple images? What's the message you're leaving people? What, do you want to leave them with questions? Sometimes you do. People say, oh, you don't want to leave people questions. Sometimes I do. I want to lead people into knowing more about the situation, going to the, you know, conservation's website, learning about that. Um, sometimes I want to get you right away with an image, the first image, to, so, like, hold you and say, like, oh, I need to see more. And so it, it really depends on, on each story and it depends mm -hmm. kind of like you do have power uh, as the, you know, the documentary photographer, as the photographer is like in, you know, video work as well, like how you want to tell the story, but you have to be accurate as well. Like if you're, for me, it's like these images will go into publications often. So I have to also do everything with journalistic integrity. I can't just say like, oh, because these images are my own, I can do whatever I want, you know, fake this and have the guy riding a rhino or something like that. Like, no, I, I have to follow these rules. And and it's, it's everyone's different, but my parameters are that. My parameters are coming from that background. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, you having an, an editor um, or editors available to you to, to, to support with that skips, you know, it skips a step almost. And what I mean by that is that Kay, Kay and I often talk about, you know, just general images we're taking, not necessarily as part of a, a story, but general images that we take, you know, we leave them a day, three months, six months, and yeah. then go to them and get that final thing. Because you, your your perception of them changes. Your emotional attachment to what you took taking it at the time is diminished. Mm -hmm. And you come out with a fresh, clean pair of eyes. But we, you know, we're always bouncing photos off each other, yeah, video I mean, it's off just, each other. It's, it's like Nick, Nick and myself, we're each other's editors in that, in that respect. Um, that's awesome that's, that you have that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's I think true a lot for... of people don't do that. They're too competitive. Photographers are so competitive, they don't like to do that. I enjoy that too. I enjoy sharing yeah. with friends that have a different outlook on things. Some friends yeah. are very similar, so I don't want it because I kind of know what they're going to say. And other friends are so different that I'd love to hear. Yeah, some, their, some their friends. Input. That's the thing, isn't it? Some friends will just go, man, it's awesome. Every time you show them something, you go like, well, that's thanks, but that doesn't really help me at this point. Yeah, you know? no, it, it doesn't. And then some friends can't take it. That's the thing I have. A, too, yeah. but like, I can be a jerk or I can be like, not a jerk on purpose, but like, if you really, it's the same when I teach workshops. I'm like, what do you want? Do you want me to just be like, do you want me to treat you as if you're going to get work at this level? Or do you want me to treat you 
as just like just baby everything and it's hard no. because like i if you really want to do it at this level you don't have to be mean but if you're honest it can yeah. come off as mean like i've done workshops where people like pay for it and they it's like hard quick because i think one workshop i did like i had like eight people and they all told me later on we cried i'm not a screamer i'm not a yeller but i was just honest i was like day five i'm like you have to go back We're, it's a six-day workshop so like one lady for example was like oh i'm just exhausted i'm like yeah i know but like you it's a six-day workshop so why not get up in the morning why not go back and like this is a great example a great story and obviously like this isn't a normal thing but she went back that six day after me really pushing her to go back so like what are you talking about how would you not go you paid for six days do six days of this project you've got great access and she actually won a world press award for the image she got in the sixth day i'm like exactly <laughs> wow, that's exactly. It. wow. <laughs> same thing happens every day but you might capture it differently you're going to see it differently like she was going to the same place with the same lady that was taking care of like it was like 30 different dogs and like she just happened to get the composition and the light everything perfect and like hmm. that's why you go back even though the same thing has happened every single day you're going to be different you're going the first few days on any shoot you're always taking like your rolodex of shots right you're always going with like your your greatest hits you know yeah. and then it's like oh the fifth day out of boredom or just like all right like you you'll you you're like i can't take that shot anymore so you stand in a different part of the room or you put a different lens on yeah. or you get in a different location or whatever it's like that's when you can get so it doesn't always work that way but it can and that's why you go as many days as you can yeah. and work as hard as you can that's it you know i used to do this actually something very similar uh, in concert photography so i started in in concert photography and so you know there's like there's certain things that you have to capture in a sense um and so because both nick and i are, are musicians as well and have a long history yeah. in like in performing um i sort of know pretty much what's happening on stage so what i would do would mm -hmm. be like you know, I'd have like a wide lens, like a 24 to 70 for the first song. So you typically get like three songs to shoot. So, right, right. you know, and so with the wide lens, I'd be figuring out what's happening. I get the wide shots, but at the same time, I'll be looking at the individual players to see how they behave, you know, whether, they, whether they're fixed to the spot or whether they're moving around or, what, you know, what their thing is, basically. And mm. then on the second song, I would go in with a 70 to 200 get all the close-ups because now i know how they're moving so i can kind of sense right, right. where they're going to be so i can get those close-ups and then for the third song i typically like break out something else like a super wide to get some crazy almost like fisheye type you know like 14 mil kind of yeah just thing. something different experimenting yeah, something right different. getting away from your normal shots like how do you ever yeah. evolve as a photographer if you're just always taking your best stuff like musicians aren't just going out and playing their greatest hits of course people want yeah. that but you've got to put that time in to come up with new stuff and experiment it doesn't exactly. always work like no, that exactly. lady that was like the extreme case but it definitely works better than not doing it <laughs> yeah, well that's it and it's you know it's, it's it's as you said you know sometimes sometimes it works out really well and you come back and you go like wow i like like on that third track like with that i don't know 14 to 24 or whatever lens they are awesome and sometimes you come back and you go like i really didn't work i'm not going to do that again <laughs> You yeah, or, or even 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 just more days. Like people say, oh, why do you need like I get that all the time. And people used to think I was crazy. Like I, I remember doing the assignment for like business week here in, in Hanoi, and the guy's like, All right, so what you come for an hour and that's it. I'm like, uh, they paid me a day rate. So the second you get up, can I be at your house? He's like a, a millionaire that like started working, like doing like a, a fund here, and you know, he's like, Why do you need so much time? I'm like, more mo more chances for moments that I can capture. <laughs> it's like, yeah. all right, and he put up with me and stuff but it's like that that's always been my attitude that really does come from my my background at school and my professor he was just always like hey you know more chances you know and there's no excuses in your captions no one's putting in the caption like only was given an hour or nothing interesting happened it was just like you need to get a good shot no one cares and i, I learned that like any magazine i shoot for a newspaper the, obviously the more time i can put in the more chances for good shots the better i can tell the story the more accurate i can tell the story I mean, I would even go as far as to like, I'd get paid for like a two day, two day assignment. And I would work a third day if I could just out of my own pocket, because I wanted to do a good job and impress my editors. So how does it work with magazines uh, typically, um, or let's say when it comes to editorials for uh, a publication, let's say like the New York Times is, um, is, do they suggest a story to you that you then go and shoot? Or does it work the other way around where you say like, well, I've got this story. Is that something you might be happy to run? 
It depends on the photographer and their relationship with the magazine. But most of the time for me, I was like, you know, living in living in Vietnam, I'd team up with one of their one of their staff writers that was based in Bangkok and he was doing a lot of stories. So when, if you're kind of in with the writer and the writer likes you, it used to be you'd go on the shoot with the writer. If it was like a newsworthy story or something really happening like right now, if it was if they were a freelancer, then they would someone had already done the story and then the editor or photo editor thought it was worthy of a professional photographer going. So then I might get the call afterwards, especially for travel stories, because a lot of freelancers do travel stories for them, freelance writers. So I would get the I would just get like 36 hours of Hoyan and I would just get like this list of places I need to shoot and the amount of time they can give me. And I had a good enough relationship for some stories because like editors in New York can be like just in their own bubble. Like I've had stories where like, oh, go to Myanmar, do this travel story. And you've got uh, two days to do it. I'm like, that's actually all those different places by their flights and stuff. It's actually physically impossible. Like I would need like four days to do that and actually spend a day in each of these places and settle in. And and so like I had a good enough relationship where they would let me do that. Things have changed quite a bit, but yeah, it kind of depends. I mean, nowadays, a lot of times if it's again, something really newsworthy and something happening, on the ground right now, you'll go with the writer and you kind of go your own way or and then meet up at the end of the day or it depends on what's visual and what kind of reporting they're doing. Another time, it's just here's the story. You've got X amount of days to do it. Does that work for you? Can you get on a flight tomorrow and do that? The 36 hour um, shoots that you did, did you... Did you make sure, you know, because I know they 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 set out in uh, in that, you know, do this in hour one, this in hour two, this in hour three, and, and, yeah. so, on and so on and so on. Did, were you in those locations at those kind of specific times? Or did oh, you, my goodness, just, <laughs> wherever makes sense, you know? I, I appreciate sunset and, you know, sunrise and yeah, things like yeah, that yeah. perhaps are a bit specific, but. No, I'm too much of a snob. So I would look at like any indoor, lo- I, I always did it my way, which was like, I care about light. So anything indoors, I would shoot in the afternoon. And anything outdoors, and it was really could I thought be a magical picture. I would shoot at sunrise, so I was like I was very methodical on how I shot that. I didn't always do it. Of course, like nightlife stuff, I had to do it then, right? I'm not gonna like go into an empty bar, but but you know if it was like <laughs> oh at at seven a.m. go to this place and it was indoors, and like I'm not I'm like I'm going indoors from nine a.m. to three p.m. <laughs> I'm going yeah. everything else. I think it's outdoors. I'm gonna shoot yeah. outdoors, but I, you know I was so young and ambitious when I first started doing that I would do like every single location that they had in the amount like and they were like you don't have to do all of them I'm like oh really I thought I had to do like every single spot I would spend a lot of time on it and I still do like I still want to get almost everything on the list that I that I can get and those are fun stories it's like a uh like a treasure hunt right it's like oh you're gonna go do this 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 this, and this and get it done and yeah. almost the amount of time that it takes to actually do those like you usually get about two days to do those stories too yeah and you, if if i if i remember correctly it, it, when you'd got you know you'd, you'd you'd get your typical you know you, there might be a food shop um related to that that particular 36 hours and um i i watched or i read that you 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 typically actually would order the food that the writer was talking about as well and yeah. shoot that in that particular restaurant what if it's something you don't like <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot I don't eat actually. I'm vegan. So it was like almost right. everything that they I would just order it and I would I usually work with a fixer, so I just like my my fixer would eat it. We'd get like one dish and he would he or she would eat it. And that's all the way I would do it. Like there's barely anything I can ever eat on those. Like every once in a while I get to do a vegetarian story and I was like, Yay. <laughs> like, very, very rare. Uh I order it because like the New York Times is all about accuracy and like ethical mm-hmm. journalism and people think that doesn't carry over into travel work but it does i mean it, you're not you don't want to lie about that stuff you want it to be fair of course i can't like barge into a hotel and pretend i'm not like doing what i'm doing because i need permission but other places i want to capture it without them like making the dish look exactly the way that you know if it looks like this i want it to look like that if this is the setup how they have it i want it to be like that i don't want them like calling people in to like make it look like it's busy at this time or faking anything so I just wanted it, I put myself into positions for it to be as accurate as possible. Obviously, yeah, like hotels that have to be like, hey, I'm here in New York Times. And they would actually be mad that the writer was already there. Like, oh, I thought, you know what? I thought there was a writer here. I thought they were, like, they never knew. And they were always mad that the writer came and did a story about them without them knowing. It was funny. Are you gaining permission for those, those kind of indoor shots at those places prior to arriving there to shoot it? Not always. You know, sometimes I'll just go and order a coffee and sit there and just capture it from 
the way I want. Other times, I you know I, I'll I'll go there and kind of like put them on the spot, like, hey, I'm here because I want it to be natural. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I don't want it to be some special glassware or or they change the way that it's done because then the people are going to go visit there. So it should be done the way that people are going to see it in the pictures. In what way is um is life different? Or, you know, how does that make your life different? Um, living in Vietnam is there like like in like on an everyday basis? Um, do you have to go about certain things very differently from back home to the US or not? Not. Let's see. I mean, everything's cheap. <laughs> so that's <laughs> nice. Everything, everything's pretty inexpensive. But I, I mean, you know, I, I, it's it's just different visually. I mean, people are people, I think, kind of wherever you go. I, I find mm -hmm. people in Vietnam very friendly. I find that uh, just photographically, visually, I'm inspired here. Like there's you could just go for a walk in your with your camera around like Long Bean Bridge, one of the famous bridges here, or the old quarter, and it's just still interesting to me. So I, I don't think my life's too too different overall here. I guess I probably have a little more freedom to do projects and things that I want. It was maybe, you know, my wife and I started our business together, and maybe that was a little bit easier or less expensive or less overhead than it would be in the US. Like mm. it's easier to have for commercial photography, to have a producer, to have a junior producer, an assistant. All that stuff. It gets really expensive in the U.S. and it's, things are a lot more affordable here. But you kind of end up, I, I will say, like what you do here in the beginning of my career is you, you have a great opportunity to do more stuff because there's, as a foreigner working for like, I'm still a foreigner working for like foreign publications in the beginning or foreign companies, but there's less maybe competition for a little while, but then the competition has grown a lot. There's a lot more talent here, but you kind of shoot everything in the beginning in your career here. It's like, One day you're doing the New York Times thing. Next thing you're doing like a Forbes shoot. Then you're doing like a product shoot. Then you're doing a wedding. Then you, so it like really made me a well-rounded, I feel a well-rounded photographer. And then you're, it's not like you on commercial shoots, you learn to play all roles too. I mean, now we're a bigger business and we do a lot of things and we have a bigger team. But in the beginning, I was like my own assistant. I was my own producer. I was my own creative director. And that's just kind of how it went. Luckily, we built this into something different now where we have all those roles, but In the beginning, I had to do everything. So I had to learn a lot kind of on the spot. I feel like now that we're um, opening up over here in the UK, it's, you know, I'm getting so many calls for, for things that I would have never gotten calls for before. You know, things that I don't ordinarily do. But, you know, at the moment, I do them anyway, because sometimes they're fun. Sometimes it, I just don't have anything else to do on that particular day, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's weird. It's like, um, it's, yeah, it's, It's just something I've noticed like over the last maybe six weeks or something, you know, since since we've really started opening up. Well, I'll take for my for example, like our our hotel work. I, I have a weird combo of work. Like I run a photography and video production business and then I do wildlife photojournalism. So like I don't make sense to people in a lot of ways. Like photographers, like, wait, which one are you? I'm like, I'm both. I do both. Yeah. <laughs> and, and but it's just like we're doing shoots now, like it's a lot of our clients before were, we work a lot with intercontinental hotels. So global brand, one of the biggest hotel brands in the world, but most of our work was outside of Vietnam. So like now that work that we used to get is going to other photographers, but now the work that other people were flying in to do is now kind of coming to us. So we've like got new brands because they had a photographer from the country that they're, you know, whatever that hotel brand is from or, or a photographer that they preferred. So it's like trading, like we're getting their work, they're getting our work. And now we're doing remote shoots. Like we just did a whole video for a, company uh, from their Singaporean company, but they have an office in Wichita City and we filmed in Hanoi. So every we hired a whole separate team to have a live feed for our entire shoot. So the clients sat in a room and watched mm -hmm. us doing this entire video production that we did. So they oh, just right. watched and weighed in. Not fun, not awesome, because it's not great to deal with that. Like they don't know <laughs> everything around. I'm not gonna lie, I mean, they're not gonna listen to us. So I can say it was like kind of a nightmare for my wife who produces the shoot, but mm -hmm. uh, I, Me personally, I can't stand all that stuff. Like if I didn't have a producer, I wouldn't do commercial work. <laughs> like, I'm a snob. I like I'm used to working alone. I, I'm very adamant about like what I do, what I do well and what I don't do well, and what I think will work. And so she kind of finesses that. <laughs> That's our dynamic. <laughs> That's my compromise in life. <laughs> Tell me about your uh, your YouTube channel, because um that's something Uh, I've, I've really, I've really enjoyed watching your videos um, on a number oh, right. of different things. Yeah. So, how did you like? How how did you um, get started with that? Was that like a product of the of the sort of pandemic, or? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely was. So I, I did television for five years. That's I say I'm kind of a weirdo photographer. Like I hosted a TV show for five years. It was done by Canon. It was a reality show about photography. It was like a game show. It was weird, and it was like. It, 
it was like so during that i did teach a lot in photography i was teaching on the show i was teaching doing workshops for canon the show was filmed in like seven or eight different countries mm -hmm. and so i had to go to all these different events for canon teach these workshops but it's like as much as i love the show and love the experience it wasn't really my audience like my the audience for that show and the audience for these events were like people that want to win photography contests so i was always up there talking about mm -hmm. slowing down and doing in-depth photo stories and having meetings to your work and they're mm -hmm. all like who cares? I just want to win a photography contest. I want to copy a picture. That's how I want to get a good picture. I'm like, no, you should want to make your own shot and learn how to do your own picture and learn how to create your own style. So, you know, during that show and having after that show, sorry, after that show, I just had time to like think I'm like, this is silly. This isn't me. This is like, I like teaching this stuff about photography. I like teaching where I came from. And I want to talk about like, my perspective on things and how to be a professional photographer in that context. And I know it's really hard and I know it's not a lot of people out there that want to do it this way. A lot of people want to be like content creators or what I just did a whole episode on YouTube photographers, which it's caused a little controversy, but I just wanted to like sort of show what it's like to be a professional photographer and talk about my experiences and rather than please the masses, just talk about what I find interesting. And, and so I talk a lot about Leica cameras because I'm really into them. They don't sponsor me, but I do have a relationship with them now, but it didn't start that way. I started because I like their cameras and I like, I like using their equipment. And I don't know. I just, I, I, I just realized like, I like this. I like teaching in this way and I miss doing it. And now it's like, I don't have to adhere to, it's like the same with my photography, right? Like I don't have to adhere to those rules anymore. I don't have to follow like the rules of like, Oh, the TV show or Canon's parameters appealing to all the people talking about these lenses and things that I don't use and don't like. Now I can talk about stuff that I like and my experiences and, and it's been a lot of fun. And I like to be silly about photography and I like to have fun with it. And I like to make fun of myself and I like to make fun of other people. <laughs> so <I really> enjoy <laughs> but I guess the <laughs> Canon audience is like a much wider, just a generalist audience. It is. Course. It's way yeah. more. If I did that stuff, I'd reach a way larger audience and I, but I just wouldn't be me. And I think this is me. So like I, I, I am now finally, it took a long time in the beginning. I didn't really meet the right people. I wasn't getting the right comments. You know, I did a, I did a, a blog about the Leica M10D, which is a very pretentious thing for a lot of people, Leica in general, but this is like a $8,000 camera that doesn't have an LCD screen. So people, I, and that article was published on uh, Peter Pixel. And then, oh my God, the comments were like, mm -hmm. people hated, people so angry and like so mad. I'm like, why are you so mad about a camera? Like, <laughs> I like it. I use it. I didn't yeah. say like everyone should ditch their cameras and use it. I have nothing against Sony or Canon. I've used Canon for years. They make a great mm -hmm. product. It's just saying at this point in my life, what I like to do, this is a good kit for me, but it took a little bit of time, but I'm now starting to see like, oh, I am finding the right people. It's not a massive audience, but it's the right audience. And that's been awesome for me. There's actually nothing more fulfilling, I think, than teaching and sharing your knowledge with someone who may not have that knowledge at the moment or reinforcing their their base knowledge. Well, I really don't think there's anything more fulfilling. What um, we, We've said this a couple of times before, that if you're getting negative comments of some description and there's some kind of uproar, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. But Maybe, I, I haven't know. seen, you, you mentioned there a, a, a controversial video that you did about um, a, a YouTube photographers. I don't think I've seen that yet. What, um... <laughs> I just published it a couple of days ago. That's ah, funny. what, what, I, I have to, I have to hear about this. <laughs> what, yeah. what happened? Well, all right. So like, all right. So I did a whole video I just launched it a few days ago about like, it's called YouTube photographers versus professional real life photographers. Right. So it's like, I'm comparing when, when I got into my YouTube channel and I was excited about it, I started to research about who else is doing what I'm doing. The same in photography. Like I like to research. I like to know who's doing, who's out there, who's doing what. And so I was looking for like other photographers that I might know doing YouTube videos and what kind of engagement do they have? What kind of videos are they doing? And I realized like, there's not a lot of names that I know. There's all these other names, like these big, I don't, I don't like to name particular names. So I'm not going to, because I'm not like a person that likes to attack individuals. I just like talking about the industry in general, but some of the big YouTube names are like these photographers a lot younger than me. And they have these flashy videos and they're fun and exciting. And like, but then they also talk about like personal projects and gear advice and like their philosophy on photography. And then I was kind of like, all right, like, BS on some of this stuff. I'm like, really? Like the personal project, you're doing a book that you worked on for a week. And I'm like, and then you see them documenting the whole process. I'm like, that's not how it works. And I just found it misleading. So I was like, listen, these, these are, this is what I find misleading to people that are potentially interested in being like a professional photographer. It's not to meant to take anything away from 
YouTube photographers, they make more money than I do probably. A lot, most of them do. Uh, they do their own thing well, that's fine. But they started to cross over into like the turf of like, they it, it feeds their brand to talk about doing real assignments, right? To talk about doing real projects, to talk about doing a book project. I'm like, okay, if you're a photographer interested in being a YouTube photographer, listen to them. If you're a photographer interested in starting a photography business and really, in, or even just a amateur that's interested in depth in your photography, the art of photography, or like understanding the philosophy of what you want to talk about in your images and storytelling, don't listen to these guys. Don't listen to most of them. There's always an exception. And I just really went off about that. And, <laughs> and I did, I, it's funny because I found my audience because my, most of the people were like, yeah, I'm glad you said it right on. And then, you know, a couple of people like were really upset. Like, that's an attack. Who are you to, uh, I like, I, it wasn't an attack on any individual. There was, you know, I, I did reference this one guy because I saw him do a video about going on a professional assignment. This is kind of what like pushed me over the edge to do it. He, I, I, I really was like saying it was quite admirable of him to actually tell the story. It's embarrassing. Like he did a professional assignment doing headshots and another like flown to another state, but didn't know how to do headshots for like a PR company, or law firm. And then basically had to hire his friend to come in and messed up the job completely and like had to give their money back. And I'm like, Hey, this, this is probably a lot of people listening to like, not him, but a lot of people listening to guys like him. And they're thinking like, this is how a professional job is done, or this is what it takes, or this is like acceptable. And a lot of things they are saying aren't acceptable if you want to go into that realm, you know? So it's kind of comparing like photographers that get paid to take pictures and then photographers that get paid to take Photographers that get paid because they take pictures, you know what I mean? Like they're getting paid to document them taking pictures rather than going out and actually getting a picture. <laughs> so that was my comparison. And I probably should have been a little kinder, but I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Cause some controversy. <laughs> I, I actually cannot wait to go and watch that now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wasn't that. I wasn't that mean, but you know, people take it. I think I was just honest. Like I just, I just think it's like, because I teach one-on-one -on -one sessions with people mm -hmm. and they come to me and they're like, oh, so like I might go off and do a book. I'm like, what do you mean? Like people don't pay you to do books. They don't make a lot of money and they don't define, like people think that that's like, oh, this person has a book, they're good. I'm like, it doesn't make you good. Some no, photographers have great books, but I could go do a book tomorrow if I wanted to publish it myself about like selfies of me, you know, holding my life up and like, it would be awful, but I could publish it. It doesn't make me any good. <laughs> yeah. And and a good book doesn't usually take a week to do. It usually takes years, to, mm. especially a story with depth. And oh, yeah. you know, also like you do see while I'm ranting, you do see these photographers go off to these like exotic locations. Like let's take Vietnam for example, and they'll spend like a week in the mountains and take like you know seventy two hundred headshots of you know ethnic minority people and call it a project and saying they understand that culture. And it's like. Is that really right. like a book? And did you really spend time and you spent like seven days and you spent six days documenting yourself taking pictures rather than like documenting them? So that that's my range. <laughs> yeah. You know, I see I see that a lot um with uh, you know, YouTube photographers or like uh, you know, um who go to the Can the Canadian Rockies where our, our family up there. And hmm. um you look at the images and they, often they like either publish books or make a video out of it. And you kind of, you look at the images and you're kind of like, well, these are all like, you've gone, this is like a sightseeing tour. Like you've gone to the same yeah. place in the road to take the same picture. Like, like Lake Louise is a really good example. For example, like everybody's taking the same shot. It's the same shot. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> well, know? it's it's the same with, I, I noticed the same thing too. I mean, that that's actually another thing that kind of like sparked me to be at least interested in their work. I was like, all right, I never see these guys' photographs. And the pictures I do see, it's usually of them, which means that most likely, unless they use a tripod, they didn't take it. You know, it's usually, <laughs> exactly. it's like, well, you can it, do the exactly. math. Like, and then it's like, they're all just getting the same pictures. They all went to like Iceland together and like took pictures with the drone of the same thing, like different levels of it, but it's all the same thing. And I was like, I don't know. Are these guys really that good? Like, I, I don't think a lot of them are that good as photographers. So they're great at video. Obviously, they're a lot more entertaining than I am. They have a huge following that, that dwarfs mine, you know? So, but should you be listening to them about starting a photography cre a career? I'm not, I don't think so. That, if you that, want to go into like a business side of photography. Yeah. That, that's, that's, I think you used the key word right there is that they're entertaining. And, yeah, that's what it is. They're good. It's good to watch as entertainment, and you will pick up little bits and pieces trickling through here and there as you go. You know, it's yeah. on, on one on one hand, there's an argument to say that as you're developing as a photographer when you're starting out, 
they're good to watch in that it it keeps you engaged and fun and you are getting some information that will will help but on the totally flip side actually they're not presenting a real world experience as what it's like to become yeah. a photographer in, <clears throat> in business and that can actually mm. harm potentially uh, a, new, a new photographer so it's a very very fine line very very fine line this is why someone like yourself who is actually out there who's actually doing this every day who is actually doing projects who has actually worked for new york times and just countless others you're selling it how it is and if people are giving you uproar on that video oh, i can't <laughs> wait to read the comments but if they're well, giving you uproar it's a Nick, good if thing I said it, if i said it as eloquently as you did with that nice british accent rather than my brash american <laughs> wildness then may, maybe i could have got away with it maybe i would have had a little better feedback <laughs> No, I, I, you sounded you sounded so nice and friendly saying it. I sounded like a bitter, I sound like a bitter jerk. I need to just insert like what you just said there into my video. No, but it's true, and, and I don't mean it to say that there's a lot of educational YouTube photographers that are fantastic, and people did misinterpret me talking of, like as if I was going after them, and I'm not because there are people that teach the basics of photography that understand even the gear reviews. They understand the technical aspect in a way that I don't understand it. And they can describe it in a much better way. Hmm. And I, that's, it wasn't an attack on them. It was more like the upper echelon photographers that are now like they're super successful. They start to believe their own stuff. They start to believe that like, you know, they're going on a real assignment and this is how it's done. Like, have you ever, did you really, or, or is that really how it is? Or do they hire you because hmm. you have 4 million followers to do a shoot for Red Bull? Like, but if they really wanted a great shot for Red Bull, they'd probably hire like an awesome action photographer, not like the guy that has a great following on YouTube, but they want his content about the picture, which is its own thing. And they do that better yeah. than me. So, you know, that was my point. But some people misinterpret it as like being mad at all YouTube photographers or being a gatekeeper. And, and I don't mean to be a snob in that way, or I don't feel like I'm a gatekeeper. It was more of just saying the t guys at the top are kind of misleading certain audiences and those are the people that i like to communicate with and those are the people that i like to teach i'll tell you what what i find frustrating is when you know you follow you follow somebody because uh, initially maybe when they first start up you know you actually get some really nice you know good information out of it but then as time goes on and as the, as the followers grow and as you know everything gets more and more commercialized you know, it take you know a, a couple of years in. All of a sudden, you watch the same person, and you just you know you spend five minutes watching a watch commercial. Th their their channel has become their business, not photography, right? <laughs> yeah, and you gotta yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. So now we're watching. Okay, so now the channel's moved from like an educational, you know, photo channel to a product commercial channel <laughs> because because yeah, you know, it, it's a. It's a tough balance, right? Because I, yeah. I understand the appeal for that. Like, I like to sell prints for my work. I like to, because it's a lot of time and effort to make these YouTube episodes. It takes a lot, you know? And it's like, yeah. so do I have something that I'm interested in selling and, and little things here? Yeah, so you have to really find that balance. And you're right, because it's like, you have to find it without losing your audience. So it's it's a tough, tough balance. And now, even during the pandemic, you look at a lot of photographers that don't have work. So yeah. what can they do? What can they sell? How can they generate income? So I, I never... I'm never going to like hate on people for trying to make a buck, but I'm going to hate on people for, you know, lying about and exaggerating really what they do for a living. Yeah. And yeah. now that we're, you know, we're talking about photography clearly, and we're talking about product placement, you know, make sure you check out this beautiful knife. It's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I've it's got my subtle. Leica right now. <laughs> <laughs> subtle, okay, subtle. It, it feels like it's either watches or it's knives, I, uh, you know. That's, uh, That's true. They all have that little pocket knife thing, you know? Yeah. I've got binoculars, so I can... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but surely they're not any binoculars. Surely they're like a binoculars. <laughs> they actually are. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Clearly. The only glass that I'll look through. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> And, you know, I fully agree with you. That's not only because I'm actually German. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> But that's make... the fun thing for YouTube is like, I like to talk about stuff that I actually use, but I'm eventually going to run out yeah. of that stuff because I only <laughs> use so many things. <laughs> I did, what made you change from, or what, what made you switch from Canon to like, I mean, they're very different camera systems, but like what, what was the initial sort of spark that, that made you switch system? It, it was, it was really my personal project and saying like, I want to do a book. I want to change. I want to slow down. I don't trust myself to slow down with a Canon. 
I need to like be forced into situations. It's a weird thing to say, but I did, I started my career, I started my career with a, like a M6, actually just before that I was using a Canon film camera, but I also come from this weird hybrid background of like shooting film, but not developing my own film. So like the film people don't like me and respect me because they're like, you didn't develop? I'm like, no, I didn't. I'm, I don't have the patience for that. I don't. I respect the people that do it. It's its own craft, its own art. I only have so much energy. I'm not good at that stuff. I like all my energy going into like taking pictures, but I like the I, I liked slowing down the way that film used to make you slow down. So I'm not mm-hmm. constantly looking at my pictures and not like that. I'm not spending my break. Like I have a lunch break just going through everything and browsing. And I don't know. I, I just, and then the I saw like a commercial or an ad for like like an M10. D and I'm like that's ridiculous. Like, and I'm like, is it? That's kind of cool. It's a digital camera without a screen. <laughs> that's how I used to shoot, right? So I could do yeah. my post production. So I don't like to do post production. I don't. My commercial work, we outsource our heavy post production. And my personal work, it's like it's a necessary evil. But I don't love doing that. Like I like it sequencing the images, but toning them, I'm like, all right, a little bit, and that's it. But this was like the ultimate hybrid for me. And then people say, well, just tape up your. Uh, LCD screen to buy a cheap camera, but it was more than that with the Leica too. It's, I like the aesthetic of a camera. Like that's important to me. If you really work in documentary and you spend, or any, even street photography or any photographer that spends long days, it's constantly on your neck or it's in your hands. And it's like, I want to pick this up. I want to hold it in my hand. I like the simplicity of it. I, I got so sick of like, I, we, we do video work and there's this Sony camera that we have that has like a menu system that it just overwhelms me. I can't stand it. I, I get that other people's brains can process it. Mine just can't. And I get annoyed. I just like to turn this thing on and I just put in my shutter. I put in my ISO and my apertures on my lens. Done. That's it. Nothing else to worry about. And I fell in love with it. I used it. I borrowed it from like a Singapore for two days. I walked the streets with it. They were kind enough to let me take it out as a loner. Fell in love with it right away. It was like going back 10 years to how I used to be as a photographer, slowing down, being methodical, being thoughtful, like, thinking in the moment, not looking at my camera constantly. Sounds cliche to some people, but it works for me. And it, it just, it made me better. And that's what I wanted to do for this project. And I've never regretted it. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, I'm, I'm willing to bet you can uh, relate to that with your, your Fuji. I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, I had exactly the same, exactly the same thought um, about, what was it, like two years ago or something. Um, I just, I just need to slow down, you know. And, uh, and so at the time I came across a Fuji X100F. Um, which was, which just turned out to be the perfect camera It's a fixed lens, you know, fixed focal length. Um, it's just so yeah. everything is, you know, it kind of, it looks cool. I like the aesthetic of it and it's, everything is very touchy feely. Like there's lots of things to turn on it, knobs and whatever else, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like, um, it makes you think more. And, um, and so, you know, especially when, when Nick and Nick and myself, you know, when, when we were able to, you know, when like, you know, when we could go into town and, and do some street photography, you know, I, I took that camera and nothing else, not, you know, no selection of lenses, like just that one thing. Um, and I think we shot, yeah, we shot black and white as well. And we, like, there was not even, it was just totally stripped down, super simple, like, um, and it was so much fun. It was so much fun to shoot. It's so different from doing any kind of commercial job where you're like constantly having to be switched on and you yeah. know, make 5 million decisions, you know? Um, right. I agree. And you know, the other thing, of course, is this uh, one massive advantage um, for me is that it, one of the thing I found, uh, one of the things I found was that when, you know, whenever I went, like, went out with a family, you know, I have, I have kids and, you know, we go out somewhere, you know, travel somewhere or whatever. Um, and I take, I take a DSLR with me and a couple of lenses or whatever. Cause, you know, of course you want to take, you know, memories or you want to make memories, and, you know. Right. Yeah. But, but the fact is, it's too much kerfuffle. You barely ever take that thing out. It's like, you know, so, right? you know, so you come home with like virtually no photos or there've been occasions where I've been out all day and I, I didn't take a single photo, you know, or maybe I just took some shots on my, some snaps on my phone or something like that. And you kind of go, well, this yeah. is a waste of time. Why have I been logging this thing around all day? It's, it's completely right. it's a liability. You're, you need a whole separate bag. You need yeah. to think about it constantly. Yeah. There's all these decisions to make in the moment. Like when you have multiple lenses or even shoot with two bodies, you're like, oh, should I be shooting with this? This lens should be shoot this lens with this is like this is it weighs a little bit, but it's yeah. it, it's small. I, I I don't need a separate bag. Usually whatever bag I have, it can fit in there. Like yeah. I like bags and different stuff, but it's like I, I'm just if I'm up at like so take the story in, in the northern white rhinos. I was up every day at 4 30. Mm. I just put this around my shoulder. I have it around my neck while I'm driving out to the 
to where they keep the northern white rhinos. And it's just like I get out of the car, even on the, while I'm driving, I'm like, oh, that's a good shot. We take it, you know, or even times that you would be like, oh, I want to put my gear away. I'm in the back of the truck with the Rangers. Let me just put that down for a second. Then you miss the shot. But this, it's like, it's just on my neck. It doesn't physically weigh me down. And I don't get home back to my, yeah. my, my little camp that I was at till like eight o'clock at night. And I'm like, I feel fine. Whereas before I would just be like, I'd be sore. I'm actually, I have actually problems in my lower back from carrying all that gear early on in my career. Mm-hmm. That's a warning yeah. to young, young mm-hmm. photographers, <laughs> pay money for expensive camera. Now save money on, on surgery later or back problems. <laughs> That's it. So everybody, you know, switch to Fuji or Leica, you know, go with the yeah. small cameras. We're not sponsored by Fuji but, or Leica, but if you do want to sponsor us, but, Fuji and Leica, if you are listening, then, you know, go ahead. But it's, <laughs> but it's also like, don't, whatever works for you. Cause there was a yeah. point in my life where this wouldn't have worked for me because sure. I just wasn't ready to be patient. And now, now I am. And I, I've allowed my, I give myself, I give myself time to slow down. And this camera forces me mm. into habits that I'm not disciplined enough to force myself into. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I recently I recently moved to moved to Canon um, over the past sort of six six nine months or whatever it's been, and t- for stills I moved to the R six, and mm. I don't think I take a thirty five prime off that at any point. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the only thing yeah. I take for stills. Nothing else. Nothing else goes on it. Very very rarely. One one out of a thousand shots maybe, but whenever I go yeah. out, I just take that. That's it. Nothing else. Much easier to take. It's smaller. I mean, it's a great yeah. system. I did. I did my first year of assignments in Southeast Asia with a Canon 5D Mark One and a 35 millimeter, and that was some of my best work I've ever done because I yeah. just it was light. I was more likely to take it with me. I thought more. I moved more. Everything. Yeah. You start to build up this arsenal, and next thing you know, you're just like a blob carrying all this stuff. You're like, you don't move. It's like it's expensive. You're worried, like, oh, should I not go down that street because yeah. I got all this expensive gear. I mean, the like is so expensive, but a lot of people don't know that it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's quite unassuming, isn't it? You know? Yeah. I actually was in Venezuela early on in my career. I was in Caracas with a, I had a, like an M6 around my neck and a 35 millimeter. It was like uh, used stuff and it was beat up. So it was maybe a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment, but these guys tried to rob us and they tried to steal my friend's Holga, which is like a $20 plastic camera. They didn't even try to steal my camera. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you idiots, do your research. If you're going to, like, we won the fight, luckily. We were larger than the guys. and They didn't have any weapons, but uh, they tried to rip off it. They didn't see my Leica or didn't even try to take it. They were pulling on his camera, and we got the fight. And next thing you know, the police were pulling a gun on us. So I thought it was like a, a range thing where the cops were involved and everything. But I kept my Leica, and he has a broken hold on us. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's so amazing. <laughs> I, get, I constantly get asked whether I'm whether I've got a film camera. Uh, with that because it, it has this kind of retro look you know and uh, yeah you get it's good and bad right because i get judged a lot because people like i put a lot of effort into setting up these stories and i go there and these wildlife people are always used to like well, wildlife photographers with yeah. tons of like big big lenses big gear big bags everything and i show up with this like wait what you know what you're doing i'm like i think so it's just different <laughs> <laughs> like where's the rest of it like that's it like, all right they never trust me they always think it's all taped up and they don't uh, just get these like embarrassing situations for like the first day they're like this guy. <laughs> yeah. I see, I see wildlife photographers. I live next to a bunch of lakes and I see wildlife photographers. That's just like a nature reserve. Um, and I see guys all the time with like massive, uh, God knows what, like 500, six, whatever those lenses are huge, yeah. all camouflaged up, you know, <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. It's like you need a little trolley to pull the thing behind you. So, and they do that well, and that makes sense for what they do. Sure. What I'm doing, it doesn't make sense at all. But it's like it takes people that aren't photographers always just like judge you based on size of your equipment. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not judging. I mean, the thing is, um, yeah, there, absolutely, man. There was a time where you know I, I thought the bigger the better. You know, I need the big lenses. Yeah, and, me too. You know, it makes me look like I'm a professional photographer or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I think as you get older, uh, the whole slowing down thing does really come into it, and. And I think, you know, I, I feel like I'm more considered now, you know, I think yeah. more about before, before I uh, push the button. It's not like when, I, you know, when I first started um, shooting concerts, for example, it was like super mega high speed auto drive all the way. And then it's like yeah. machine gun. You have the belt, you have the giant belt system. Did you have that going on? Oh, I didn't have the belt. No, I, like, <laughs> no, I, don't, I feel like, like rapid, whatever they called rapid straps or whatever, but uh yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was more luck than anything. And then, you know, over 
over time, of course, you get a lot more considered. And so, you know, the difference is instead of coming home with like 6,000 shots, you know, you come home with like 600, but they count. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the difference. It, that's exactly it. And now it's like, and even having a camera that has like mechanical buttons, it does like you feel like you're crafting something. It makes yeah. it feel like a little bit more important for some reason. It's a psychological thing, but it happens to work for me. So I, I like that too. It makes me a lot more calculated as well. Yeah, you definitely you, think more about it. You know, I, I mean, especially because I take I take the Fuji out uh, predominantly for like street photo like street photography stuff or, mm. um, you know, trips. It's usually it's also like a a really useful behind the scenes camera. You know, when there's stuff yeah definitely to be done, like even if it's like a time lapse or whatever else. Um, and so I find it I find it really useful. And it's just, I'm slightly uh, obsessed with bags. I have a problem. I have me more too. Bags. I I also have me too. Welcome to the club. I mean, you know, yeah, I have more bags than my wife. <laughs> and it's, it's a thing. I do too. Jules, so I have more I, high heels. Okay. Huh? <laughs> I um no, but no, no, no. you know, but I am I am beating her on the. I have longer hair as well, so that's. <laughs> so, that's true. Yeah. I I definitely don't. I'm bald. I've got, I've got a lot less. I have more. But I, like, I work with a couple bag companies, so I'm like overly bagged out. I just have too many bags. I have a I have a real problem when it comes to bags. Um, I it's addicting. I, I have I have recently discovered a bunch of like military surplus places. <laughs> it's bad news, bad news for my habit. I found this really cool. Um, this is actually is in con in connection in connection with the with the Fuji. Um, I found I was looking for like a little takeout bag, you know, almost like a day bag type of a thing, you know, a man. What's it called? A, ma it's a called man. It's called a handbag. Bag. Man, man purse. Or... Yeah, man purse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but I found this. I found this. Um, this this nineteen fifties British Army gas mask bag, um, which is which is cool. It's a really cool little you know bag, and it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect for the for for that camera. You know, just to like for a day trip or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it obviously. I mean, it came empty. There wasn't a gas mask in there, but it smells like it smells like the gas mask. It smells like it smells like gassy rubber or something. <laughs> Gassy rubber. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> to coin a phrase, right? There. Gassy it. rubber. Yeah, it's yeah. weird, yeah. Is that um, how they sell it? Is that in their marketing plan? Probably. No, it had this thing inside. There was this thing inside. Um it was like a little like a little pot of like a waxy uh, substance. And I think what it probably was, it was probably something to lubricate the rubber so it didn't it wouldn't get um all like brittle. You know, and I guess mm. maybe or maybe maybe so it it Maybe it makes a better seal or something. To, whatever the thing was, I don't know anything about gas masks really. But it just had this little, uh, this little pot in there with this little container with this with this waxy substance, and that really smelled. You know, if you like, if you know what like, you, you know, rubber smells like. Yeah, that's you really why selling this bag. I know. <laughs> you should be their spokesperson. I know. It's a great bag, man. It's a great bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, right. they're like they stink like they used to have like I don't know if you should be the spokesperson for this bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best bag ever. <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, it smells like what's the smell of war in there. <laughs> right. I know. The smell of <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. But you know, it works. It's it's perfect. It tell, tell us a little bit about your commercial work because I know you've ah. got um, you were talking about your um, your commercial photography and video um, work as well. Yeah, well, I started with commercial work out here because you you just kind of like I mentioned earlier, you kind of have to do everything, right? So I was just looking for other ways to generate income. I, I like to keep busy, so I'm not the kind of photographer that likes to do like a shoot for a week and then another three weeks just hang out in the coffee shop and talk about that shoot. Like I, I just want to hustle, I want to work, I want to keep going. So I was always looking at different ways to 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 work. And so I, I started to, I got into commercial work mainly because I was doing work for New York Times travel section, but then I started doing work for Condé Nast, which is a luxury travel magazine. And then I started shooting like really nice hotels. So I was lucky enough to get like my foot in the door shooting beautiful high end look five star hotels around Southeast Asia. And I could do it my way. Like I could do it in an editorial style. And then I, some of them were like, Oh, this is cool. Like you use all natural light and this is different. Like, can we buy those? And like, Absolutely. And it would pay me more for like one picture than I would have made in like that three day assignment for the magazine. Mm -hmm. And then I started to think like a light bulb went off. I'm like, oh, this could be kind of fun. I'll shoot hotels and I'll shoot it my way. And I 
I shot it my way for a little while, but I had to compromise a bit. <laughs> you know, you can't, couldn't shoot it with a Leica and full documentary style. So I, mm. I just kind of grew into that. And then that grew into video production. And then that grew into like full on production. Like we do, I brought my wife on board and she handles, she, she comes from a background in television in Vietnam, which you have to do even more stuff here, more roles. So she knew how to edit, she knew how to direct, she, how, mm. she does everything. She directs a lot of our shoots now as well. Some I direct, some she directs, but she will organize the entire shoot and we're lucky enough, enough to have a big client like Intercontinental Hotels and be on their approved list. So that means like there's not a lot of people that actually like other people can shoot for them, but they should be using us. So we're very we're very lucky in that regard. And then that just turned into like shooting other hotels and shooting other commercial work. And mm. we just got bigger and bigger and bigger and it kept us busy. And that's when I got away from doing a lot of the journalism work. And that's why I wanted to get back into doing it because I missed out on that sort of, you know, chasing Jason, work. I mean, when you come from a freelance life, you just, anytime you get a job, you just take it. You know, I used to just take everything. I like, and that just turned into like, oh my God. I, I mean, there was months where I would do like a wedding shoot. Then I'd be doing a story for like CNN. Then I'd be doing, doing like shooting like a food shoot of like a, you know, a food vendor or something like that. And then I'd be doing studio portraits. Like I just, it was so, so many different things. Never had time to take a breath. So I got into that work. I, I, I still do a lot of that work. That's still a big part of my business, but I try to be a little more selective on the roles that I take and we're business now. So I have other people do shoots for my business as well. So it's, it's kind of nice that we're kind of diverse in that, in that regard. So it's, it's, it's good. There was good before COVID and now it's, it's good still, but just kind of in a different way. So I, I just try to keep that balance, you know, cause it, it's like, it's, you sound like a jerk saying like, oh, it's exhausting doing five-star luxury hotel shoots, but it is, it's like they're long days, you know, we did a shoot in the Maldives and it was like 4.30 AM to like seven o'clock at night working. And then you're backing stuff up and you're going over the, with the producer, the, the looks and styles for the models the next day and the schedule and all that. So it just, yeah, I, I shouldn't say that. You should just cut that out. So I'm just not such a jerk complaining about shooting in the Maldives at five-star <laughs> resort, but it's exhausting. <laughs> I guess creatively it wasn't that exciting at some point, but, uh, yeah. so I try to find that balance and that's how I kind of got back into personal projects as well, because I really miss doing stuff that I really, really deeply care about. So I'm just, Oh, I think every photographer will always go through that battle of like finding that right balance to, you know, you can go to sleep at night and feel good about yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, we've sort of come full circle, you know, I think, um, in like it, talking about personal projects. Um, I recently wrote um, a blog for scottkelby.com uh, about the importance of personal projects. Um, and if you are watching yeah. this, then uh, go check that out. Um, it's on scottkelby.com, the uh, website address awesome. will be at the bottom of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all about, um, yeah, it's, it's literally all about the importance of finding personal projects. Um, to get your teeth into, you know, and not only, not only because it, it helps you to, you know, to get out of a rut potentially, but also because it's a perfect vehicle to convey a message that's important to you, you know? So if like in your case, for instance, um, when it comes to animal welfare, um, there's a number of, of examples for personal projects that I found really quite striking that I come across. One, one had to do with documenting, um, World War II, uh, veterans, for example, uh, that were still alive. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to a project on that. And then, um, mm. There was a project on um, on the uh, on mental health, on mental health awareness, and you know combating that stigma that's attached to to mental health um, and that sort of thing. That was another um, another really interesting uh, project that I, that I came across, and so it's just it really kind of fits really well within that. You know, within that. Within that yeah, because when you when you're working so much, it's easy to forget you work so hard to get work, then you get work and you miss doing, you forget why you fell in love with photography. So sometimes yeah. in my case, it took, took a decade to get back to that, but it's so important to you. I, I'm a big advocate of personal projects as well. I, I talk about it all the time. I give a TEDx talk in Hanoi about it. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's the first thing, or if someone just takes one thing away from this or anytime I talk to a, someone new into photography or just needs like a, a reboot in their photography, I always talk about a personal project and how important it is. And my regrets that it took so long in between projects, but you're right. It's not just, it's, it's also time for you to develop as a photographer and make mistakes and reinvent yourself and experiment. Yeah. In addition to the, you know, the part about like, yeah, doing something meaningful, which is that on its own is enough reason, but yeah. it's time to, it's a great time for you to experiment. It's a great time for you to take a step back. And like our theme today, it's a great, it's a great time for you to slow down. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's as much about 
you know, develop, developing or self-development uh, as a photographer in the technical sense. But, you know, for instance, um, I mean, often it, there, there are a whole bunch of other things that you can develop um, that will enhance the results that you're getting. Like in my case, for instance, um, I started a project uh, last, well, 2019 called Three Heads in a Row, which is all about photographing people in a certain particular way. It's, it's a little bit, um, what's the word? It's a farcical, almost cartoonish, and it's, but the 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 fun part about that is, is you know to push the subject to the point where they're comfortable, you know, giving you those facial expressions. For example, it's you know yeah. this is the thing. It's all about um, building up that trust because that doesn't happen in the first ten minutes. You, you know, I'm sort of sitting sure. like a meter and a half um, opposite them. You know, especially if they're people who I don't necessarily know. So you know, it's building up that trust and, and like just just edging them further and pushing them to the point where you can come up with some really like these comical expressions um, in the end. Not everybody's comfortable with that right off the bat. It just yeah. take, you know, and and it's that kind of thing. And I find that very useful. Um, it's definitely helped me uh, developing my sort of people skills, if you want. Um, and that, yeah, you know, yeah. that comes in, that comes into play when I do regular, you know, um, corporate headshots, for example. It's all, you know, it all now plays part of that because, um, because it's something that I've developed predominantly through shooting you know, the three heads in a row uh, that, project. That's a good point is what a lot of people don't even think about when they, 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 just, they just want to remain true to one discipline. It's like, you can learn so much from other disciplines. I mean, even outside of photography, you can learn from looking at painters and sculptors about composition, different things like that and color. But yeah. even just photographers, like the amount of stuff that I learned, I the amount of stuff that I took from my editorial work and my photojournalism work into wedding work and then and then doing wedding work and what I took out of that to do portrait work mm. and then just getting sharper, like sharpening my skills. Like even like, I just had someone ask me a question of the day, like, Hey, I do a lot of weddings. I want to get into photojournalism. And they said, like, I'd like to approach clients like the New York times, like, but I can't show them wedding, wedding work. Can I? And I'm like, yeah, actually, like I was nervous. The same thing. I, w I remember going to the New York times office when I was starting out my career and I had a bunch of wedding work and I was like, is this a trick? Cause the lady asked me like, do you have any wedding work? I'm like, now, everything at school taught me don't say I shoot weddings because I'm a wedding photographer. I'm not a photojournalist. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, but I had. And I'm like, uh, are you sure? And like, she's like, yeah. And then later she's like, hey, I tell you what. She's like, I love your wedding work. She's like, I got hired actually because of my wedding work. She's like, if you can shoot these kind of images under that pressure, you can shoot any story I can give you. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, really? I was like, I passed. <laughs> I was like, yes. She's like, yeah. I was like, I was afraid to show that work. And, and mm. photographers love to be pretentious in that way. Like, when I, if you're doing wedding, if you're doing wedding work and also photojournalism, the photojournalist like to say, oh, he's a wedding photographer. Now, I never fell for that kind of stuff. And that's what I say about removing myself for that world, because I'm proud to say I did wedding work. I don't do it anymore, but I'm proud to say I did. I learned a lot from it. I made money to help me do other stuff, but I learned skills. I took pictures that have meaning. It's all kind of fits into what I love about yeah. photography. A wedding is everything in one day you can do in photography. You better be good. Like you have to take detail shots, candid shots, portrait shots, group shots, everything. You have to be like on it yeah. and you have to do it for like 12 hours straight. So the skills that I learned and the energy and keeping that energy, keeping that positivity, being able to stay creative at like 14 hours on your feet, like all that. I learned a ton from that kind of stuff. So I think you can pull pull from a lot of different disciplines. You don't have to stay in one lane as a photographer, even though photographers like to tell you you should. Yeah. And again, you know, kind of, uh, talk about weddings, you know, it's, it's, it's the same, it's the same sort of thing. Of course, more technically, yes, you have to be good because a lot is, is writing on it. Like, you know, you don't want to mess up the first kiss or the first dance or something yeah. like that. That's like, you know, you're ruining, potentially ruining somebody's like special. Yeah. Well, that was my, yeah. that was my editor's point, you know, like, Hey, you did, you could get these shots creatively under that pressure. Mm. You can do that for me too. I'm like, yeah, I can. <laughs> I yeah. felt good about it. And the other thing is, uh, you know, in my experience, and I don't really shoot many weddings. I, I shoot weddings when I'm asked to shoot some, you know, uh, but it's not necessarily what I predominantly do. But, um, the, the friends of mine who are really excellent wedding photographers, the one thing I notice is that they're just really great people, persons, persons, yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, because as you said, it's like keeping that energy up and keeping that rapport going, you know, with the guests and the father of the bride and like being that, that sort of friendly guy and having that energy all the way through that even at the end of the day, you can still motivate people to, you know, um, almost like pose for you as a for a picture or whatever yeah and still be creative in in situations that aren't always visually that pleasing you know like yeah. ceremony shots like are great but then the reception that's hard to get good pictures so i admire the ones that can pull off those beautiful shots like even you know in bad banquet rooms and things like that like it's, it takes a lot of skills 
Uh, anybody, anybody who can get a good picture of a person eating is definitely high up on my list. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. That's how I usually eat when they eat. That was always my motto. I'm well, like, I'm going to eat when you're eating because you don't want pictures of you eating. They're like, okay. Deal. Exactly. I always, you know, I only shoot those pictures for my own personal enjoyment, of course. <laughs> 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 Some weird it does, it does actually, actually, weddings do teach you a lot about commercial work because you're right, it's people skills as well. It's learning to like manage expectations, learning to, you know, have a clear direction and be able to describe your style of photography when they're hiring you, what you hope to accomplish, what needs to happen, not making excuses when things don't happen, adapting on the fly. That all those things happen in commercial photography as well, yeah. happen in journalism too. You just can't arrange things like you can in. in in commercial work yeah, or adapting. weddings you can for the portraits, but that's it. <laughs> well, adapting on the fly is a big one. I mean, I don't think, I've, yeah. to be honest, I don't think I've been on a single shoot where everything's gone a hundred percent according to plan. I mean, that's always, yeah. you know, sometimes it's just, sometimes everything goes the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, but Nick, having a good producer is important. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Nick, Nick and we went out on a shoot. Well, it was kind of, you know, we went out for a little trip, a little drive the other day. Um, but the idea, the idea was that we, we needed to do a test shoot um, with a car. Uh, so it was like a driver car portrait type of thing. We needed to do a test shoot for that. Mm. Um, and so we had, we had a, a really cool car for, for the day. Um, and so we decided to you know, pack all the gear in. Um, it was a Porsche, so it was like we were very limited. In oh, nice. Time. Yeah, it was nice. It was a nice, you know, yeah. really nice day, a nice car. Um, but not a lot of space to take gear, so we had to be very selective. Um, in yeah. in uh, the gear that we could actually take, so it took a couple of couple of strobes and a bunch of stuff, and and uh, and uh, and then the next thing was like, well, we hadn't really really thought of a location that much, and so we spent most of the day really just driving around, <laughs> checking out different locations, and you know, the some of the locations that that we that we thought would be good, uh, we couldn't get access to, so that was mm. you know it, it sort of. Um, through a spanner in the works. It's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, that was annoying. Um, I say, they're really parking lots. It would have been perfect. Why do they fence them off? What's the deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> to stop people that, like honestly, us. That's, that's, that's a great thing about working with the team is that I just say, I want this, this, and this, and they tell me what they can and can't get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, you know, for us, it was, it was literally like, okay, because um, we were actually supposed to shoot something different. So that particular day, we had put aside uh, for for a different project, and then uh, the that particular shoot didn't come together, uh, mainly because I think it was the weather or something. Um, and so we kind of thought of an alternative, and then we managed to to get access to this car. And so we thought, like, okay, well, let's just do a test shoot because that'll come in handy. That and, sounds like fun. Yeah, it was cool. Um, and we ended up we ended up in a forest at some point, um, doing some shots. And uh, yeah, and I mean, the shots turned out well. They're cool. You know, definitely more fun to shoot. More fun to shoot the car or drive the car? Drive it. Uh, I was definitely driving it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, that's the car you're you're getting right now, right? You just ordered that? Similar. Actually, yeah. It is yeah. very similar. Right awesome. <laughs> very similar, yeah. <laughs> that, exact, that exact car? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a newer model. Right on. Good model. for you. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Quite excited. Won't lie. Yeah. Should be. That sounds yeah. awesome. So I think the first we thing we'll end up Porsche doing the other is day too, which is weird. What's that? We rented one for f filming a, a shoot we were doing here in Hanoi the other day. We, we were droning a, a Porsche, not a fancy 911 Turbo. It was like a, the this four door one. It wasn't as cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> but nice. the, the one with the I, I can't remember. That's how bad it was. But what's the one with like the big back? It's like the bubbly. It's got like a butt on it. Oh, I, I know exactly what, yeah, I think I know the one you mean. Um, I, I I'm really, I I'm should getting, know this stuff. I used to know about cars, but. I'm, I'm totally, I'm getting totally confused with all the like numbers, like nine something, whatever. Numbers. And, you know, again, I should, I should know because A, I'm German and B, I'm actually from Stuttgart where yeah. they make the Porsche. So. All right. So, yeah. You have, uh, I, I'm, I'm in Vietnam. We barely ever see Porsches around here. So I have an excuse. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it's, um, I mean, there's, you know, we've got some plans some plans uh for the next couple of months to um get some drones involved and you know awesome um but yeah. uh but yeah but, th but this particular shoot was it was meant to um it, it was meant to actually originally it was meant to uh, involve a whole range of cars um mm. 
and their drivers. But uh, but then we literally had torrential rains and flooding over here, and so the whole it was it was That's right. yeah. it was meant to be like a whole day just driving. Um, but then that got canceled mainly because of the weather. So Justin, we've touched on your YouTube channel um, already. What are your future plans for that? Well, when I first launched it, I was hoping that I would start to hit the road again. I could do some like behind the scenes of my Kindred Guardians project, but a little bit of behind the scenes, but more like spend a couple of extra days to do some documentary stuff so I could actually have video and put that on YouTube. So a tiny bit of like me doing stuff, but like I talked about, I'm not into doing a lot of that. I want to focus on my project, but I was going to try to budget an extra day or two to do these video stories for my project. So once I can travel again, I'd like to revisit some of the stories that I really liked working on, like the Rhino story specifically, that one's really, I've been attached to and I've been in touch with, I've been back twice and I want to go back a third time and do some video work there. Um, I Once I can go outside a little more, like maybe just film some, just like I'm trying to find some fun ways to like teach, but not just talking into the camera. Like I'm doing that now and I enjoy doing that, but it's kind of fun to get outside and do some stuff as well. So I'd like to go out and do some things like a little more active, a little more in motion that kind of stuff. But I, I just want to keep talking about like different things about photography that I find that I want to get out there, like different experiences that I've had, teaching things, hopefully people can learn some things. And again, it's like, just now that I have a clear direction, which is like professional advice from a working professional for people that want to be working professionals or people that like that kind of style of photography or want to go into like long form documentary work. Those are the people I kind of want to, I want to talk to and engage with. And I'm, and I'm finally finding them and it's been a lot of fun. So I just want to Keep getting new stuff out there. Keep keep talking to these people. Keep talking to the, the audience I'm, I'm engaging with, and and just see where it goes. Fantastic. Have you got any uh, workshops planned over the next? Uh, years nothing or? in nothing in person. I was going to do some. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to do one with the Northern White Rhinos, but it's it's complicated right now. So everything's kind of on hold for workshops. I, I do one on one consulting sessions, and those are a lot of fun because. I like to teach one-on-one. -on -one. It's a fun way to teach. In big groups, it can be hard to get to know people. It's hard to know what their aspirations are, like really. And it's like you have 10 people and you only got a couple of days with them. So one-on-one -on -one gives me time to like get to know people a little bit beforehand, do a little research about their work, and then direct questions with direct answers, and then really like targeted advice to them. And, and that's been a lot of fun for me. Like I, uh, I'm talking with someone, uh, I talked with someone the other day in Ho Chi Minh City, like an older, elderly guy who's like really, not elderly, but like older an <laughs> older gentleman who's like approaching retirement age that's interested mm -hmm. in doing a certain kind of street photography and just talking to him about like, like just kind of clarifying what he wants to do. Like he doesn't want to make money off of it, but a little passive income could be okay, but he cares more about the craft. So, you know, teaching him about personal projects and telling them how to approach that and giving him some, some advice on that. That was a lot of fun. And it's fun to see people develop too. And like they send you pictures along the way. And it's, it's like going back to how I started photography, which is very communal. And when you become a professional photographer, you become very isolated because people become very competitive. So now I don't have to worry about that so much. It's kind of nice to go back to sharing and teaching. Yeah. And I enjoy that. I, you it must know, be nice to see progress of um, yeah. Yeah, students, if you like, um, you know, six months, a year, five years after you've, 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 you've worked yeah. with them and see the progress. Yeah, and the ones I give free advice for, of course, I take 10% throughout their entire career. I mean, it's part of my contract. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they make. No, it, it's it's a lot of fun. It's great to see people. Uh, it's great to see people grow as photographers. And it's fun to, like, give advice. Because when I was in school, like, there wasn't a lot of advice from, like, a working photographer. I didn't have access to that. I didn't. I made a lot of stupid mistakes. So it's just nice to be able to, like, Okay, I can give that someone. Don't make the same mistake I made. Like when you do a commercial shoot, get a deposit. Don't give your stuff away on without a watermark until you get the rest of the money. That's okay in our industry. It's fine to do. You'll get burnt the one time you don't do it. So do it. And people are like, oh, I never thought of that. And you think it's so. I think it's so obvious, but obviously it's not. I used to make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. So it, that that to me is fun. Those are the kind of things I like to talk about in one on one sessions. Those are the things I like to talk about on YouTube as well. Right, we have come to the end of this week's episode, episode 68 of the Camera Shack podcast. Uh, Justin, it was super awesome to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. Wicked. So uh, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, then you know, rest assured that if just listening to our sultry voices isn't enough for you, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash camera shake where you can see us in full Technicolor which of course would be awesome. Also, you know, once you're there, uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button, ring the belly thing, you know, whatever YouTubers always tell you to do, uh, because that'd be awesome for us. Um, if you insist, 
on listening to this podcast on uh, Apple Podcasts, then do us a flavor, scroll all the way down on the show thing and give us a little star rating and leave a comment because it's always wicked to hear from you. Um, likewise, if you do live anywhere in Southeast Asia, um, then get in touch with us. Again, it's always wicked for us to uh, to hear where you're from and where you're listening to the show from. So send us an email, um, send us a, uh, I don't know, message, tie a thing to a pigeon and throw it over. Just get in touch. It'd be awesome. That being said, we shall see you again next Thursday. Bye.